just uh, recaptured everyone. So uh, once again, uh, Luca Trevisan. <laughs> All right, so we, we now got to the point of having defined what is a computational problem from the point of view of uh, average case complexity and what are various ways of defining what it means for an algorithm to efficiently solve such a computational problem. Uh, and now towards the goal of uh, kind of replicating as much as possible of uh, what we know how to do for uh, worst case complexity. I would like to describe how you reduce one problem to another. So how you, um, so reasoning backwards, how you can uh, start from one problem for which you have reason to believe or conjecture that it's uh, intractable, it's uh, hard. It doesn't have efficient algorithms as we just defined. And how to uh, then show that some other problem also is intractable and doesn't have uh, algorithms of this type. Uh, uh, now let's maybe think about uh, decision problems, like problems that have a, a yes or no answer as a concrete example, although the definition of reduction also applies to other kind of problems. So let's say we have two uh, problems, some problem P with some distribution D over inputs, some problem P prime with some distribution D prime. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, if there wasn't a distribution in the middle, then a reduction would be some uh, polynomial time computable uh, transformation function uh, f that maps uh, inputs of problem P to inputs of problem P prime. Uh, such that the correct answer stays the same, uh, such that So the correct answer for uh, an input x, x of uh, p is deducible in the case of decision problems, let's say it's the same as the uh, correct answer for uh, f of x. Uh, as an input of p prime. So then the way you would convert an algorithm of p prime into an algorithm for p would be uh, given an input, compute f, uh, treat f of x as an input to p prime, you have an algorithm for it, solve it, and then get back the answer. Uh, so that's how it works for uh, worst case complexity. Now the issue with uh, distributional problems is that um, if you apply this type of transformation, then you might take a typical input for problem P and then obtain a highly uh, structured and uh, unlikely input for problem P prime. Now, what we know about the algorithm for uh, P prime is that it's typically efficient, but there will be so several inputs on which it's uh, not efficient at all, or according to other possible definitions, there might be large subclasses of inputs on which it's incorrect. Uh, and now if uh, this uh, transformation is not carefully crafted, what could happen is that basically all the possible inputs for P get transformed into so very specific types of uh, inputs for P prime, which happen to be all the inputs on which the P prime algorithm fails. So what's kind of missing for a definition to work out is something that tells us that if we take a 
high probability mass inputs for P and we apply F, we should overall get a high probability mass um, so set of uh, uh, possible maps. Now, the way Levin uh, defines it is again kind of uh, um, something open to uh, criticism, and maybe we'll see uh, some of the issues that uh, come up. So let, let, let's look at uh, Levin's definition of reduction. Uh, so it's a so the function f as before. So it's a reduction in the standard sense, uh, such that. I guess I will make a. I guess I'll make an assumption that uh, simplifies the definition a bit, although it's possible to the, make the definition work also without this assumption. Uh, so, uh, because remember we were talking about having a, so different distributions for inputs of uh, uh, different lengths. Maybe you're talking about graphs. So there's a distribution for graphs of size n for every n. So I will uh, think about f as mapping. Um, so inputs in the support of uh, d sub n. So these are inputs uh, of p to inputs in the support of uh, d prime for some other length l. So maybe if it's a reduction from graphs to graphs, it will map graphs of size n to graphs of some other size, but always the same size. It will not sort of sometimes produce bigger graphs and sometimes produce smaller graphs. Uh, it's also possible to make the definition work if the outputs of the reduction has a variable length. It's uh, so it just adds technicalities that maybe obscure what is going on. Okay, so that's a sort of un unnecessary but simplifying assumption. And uh, mm, so the interesting property will be so this idea that uh, you have to map high probability mass subset of inputs to high probability mass uh, subset of inputs. And Levin chose to give this definition actually input wise as opposed to talking about sets. Um, so it will say such that for uh, every uh, y in the uh, support of the target distribution. The probability of uh, getting Y through the reduction is at most uh, polynomially larger. So, Then uh, the probability of y in the target distribution. So maybe perhaps before uh, discussing this definition, let's think of what would be the kind of gold standard of uh, reductions that preserve average case stability. But the ideal thing would be that f works in such a way that if I that um, if I pick a random x according to my uh, distribution d, and then apply f to it, then this induced distribution of uh, values f of x is precisely the distribution d prime. Because then my reduction would be mapping a random input of p according to distribution d into a random input of p prime with distribution d prime. So then it's clear that whatever works on uh, p prime 
And Nipran will also work on uh, P because I'm literally creating the same distribution. But um, so that would be a great definition. It's just that getting reductions that works like this, it's uh, almost always impossible to sort of precisely match the uh, target distribution. But it's also too much to ask for because really all that you're really uh, asking is that if D prime has some low probability mass set of uh, bad inputs, you don't just keep hitting them uh, with your uh, distribution of um, f of x. So uh, sort of bad inputs that have low probability according to D prime should also have low probability according to f of x for a random x. And so that's what the uh, Levin definition is um, aiming for. You just say that um, if you have some kind of problematic inputs for uh, your algorithm for uh, P prime, they will be generated as f of x for random x with probability no more than a polynomial times the probability that they would have been generated by uh, D prime. Uh, now, this definition, you could sort of say that certainly satisfy, certainly preserves the definition of tractability that uh, some suggested. Like if there's some algorithm that uh, is correct, except on a negligibly small fraction of inputs. Negligibly small means that the probability mass uh, decreases faster than any inverse polynomial, like it decreases at least like one over amplitude log n or more. Well then, uh, whatever is a problematic input for your algorithm for p prime according to distribution d prime, uh, but sort of any time your f of x is one of those inputs, you are failing in the reduction. But the probability of this will be at most uh, a polynomial in n times an negligible function, which is still a negligible function. Uh, but then it's also preserved by Levin's definition and uh, in Pagliazzo's definition, because there, so if, if you take the point of view of the algorithm with two inputs, one is the true input, one is the accuracy parameter, then in the reduction, you just have to scale your accuracy parameter by whatever is this uh, polynomial. And you still get a polynomial running time. And uh, now, uh, uh, criticism, well, uh, perhaps one uh, uh, issue with this definition is that um, this function f itself is always right, in, in the sense that it always must uh, compute some f of x for which the correct answer is the same as the correct answer for x. But actually, it will be fine if the reduction itself fails sometimes. Like maybe it, it maps to some uh, other input for which the correct answer is different, provided this doesn't happen too often. Also, we're asking a function f to run in polynomial time, but actually it will be okay if it ran in uh, expected polynomial time or uh, if it was efficient according to the definitions that we uh, gave before. That will also be uh, okay. Uh, so another point is uh, requiring this kind of property for uh, every possible spin in the support of the distribution D prime. While maybe something that talks more about perhaps subset of uh, inputs might be easier to achieve. Um, but the thing is actually, even with possibly any of uh, these generalizations or weakenings of the definition that one could uh, introduce, it's actually extremely difficult to get any reduction to work. I, um, I, I will tell you in a minute a reduction that works, it is something actually extremely interesting with data compression. But um, somehow, if you think about any of 
the problems that are being talked about in the other lectures of the bootcamp and uh, sort of uh, the objective of uh, this program. Reductions among them are extremely difficult and so mostly unknown. Uh, like, I don't know, take the random four sat and random three sat. Can you reduce the problem of certifying and satisfy a bit of random four sat? to the problem of certifying random unsatisfiability of run, uh, unsatisfiability of random three sat. And it's not clear how you uh, get started about uh, thinking that. You can certainly do three sat to four sat, but not the other way. Or uh, planted click with different click size. I mean, clearly the bigger is the planted click, the easier is the problem, but um, if you have some algorithm that finds clicks, planted clicks of size, I don't know, uh, 20 log n, is it clear it implies that you can find planted clicks of size 30 log n? Because those are totally different distributions of graphs. And uh, somehow if I give you a graph with a planted click of size 20 log n, can you get one that has a planted click of size 30 log n? Can you do it with only a poly? nominal domination, uh, like you see here. I mean, it's, um, it's not clear. So the, um, so a lot of problems are kind of trivially reducible to one another from the point of view of uh, worst case complexity are kind of uh, uh, tricky here. Before click, you can do it like you'll, um, no, actually, I'm not sure. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't think too, uh, too much before making those examples, but uh, if you pretty much think about any two problems that you're interested in from the point of view of um, coverage case analysis, or even one problem that you're interested in, but you change one parameter, it's very unlikely that you can, that you can construct a reduction uh, between them. Uh, so in fact, that's the main bad news about this whole theory that uh, kind of when it works, it says very interesting things, but uh, it almost never works. Like it's uh, extremely difficult to construct reductions according to any uh, reasonable definitions. The few reductions that we know satisfy the definition that is written here. All right, so now I want to um, sorry. Right, now I want to work with this definition and uh, come up with a complete problem for uh, NP. Like I want to come up with one particular problem and uh, something that is sort of reasonable to call the uniform distribution of inputs. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I will show that any wooden average algorithm according to any of the definitions we talked about for this one problem implies wooden average algorithms for uh, all problems in NP, not under all distributions, but under a lot of uh, distributions. All right, so for now we will uh, uh, think about uh, when I say lots of uh, distributions, we'll talk about what are called, uh, or what Levin called uh, polynomially computable distributions. Which are uh, uh, distributions where uh, uh, given a Y, we can compute in polynomial time the cumulative probability of uh, y. Where this is some total ordering, maybe it's the, the excitographic order. Okay. So we'll call a distribution of inputs uh, polynomially computable 
if you can compute in polynomial time the cumulative distribution functions for inputs of a certain length, like given some input, tell me what is the probability of getting one that is lexicographically smaller. Uh, and then we'll see how to um, sort of handle more general classes of uh, distributions for now we will uh, talk about this. Um, and we will deal with the following problem, uh, a canonical NP complete problem called uh, bonded halting. Uh, not a very natural one, but it's sort of a starting point. So in this problem, an input, it's a non-deterministic Turing machine. And an input X. And a number, an integer a T. And the question is, It does M accept X in time at most T. So this is a, a problem that we can prove in a, in a minute that is NP complete in the standard sense. We will sort of prove the next half hour that it's also complete in a average case sense. And so, and so this will prop tie together uh, a lot of the loose ends that we've accumulated so far. So first, let's see that this problem is um, NP complete in the standard sense according to um, so worst case complexity. So take any uh, NP problem. Uh, I don't know, uh, A. So that means that A is decided by a non-deterministic Turing machine uh, MA in polynomial time. So a deduction from uh, A to this bounded halting problem it's that given input x for a, we can uh, construct the input uh, input like this. So this is a, a possible input for the bonding halting problem. And uh, the question, does ma accept x in time at most uh, uh, p is precisely the question is X a yes input for uh, A? And certainly from mm, this triple can be constructed from X immediately just by writing down the code for the Turing machine, copying X and then uh, writing down this polynomial bond. Uh, there's only uh, one issue about this problem is that this number T, uh, if you just write it out in binary, the number of bits it takes is log t. So you can actually feasibly write an exponentially big number. And so um, somehow now this problem is not even in NP anymore because we are talking about an exponential time non-deterministic machine. So this number t uh, needs to be written down in some way so that the space that t takes as part of the input, it's proportional to t itself. So we will assume that this is written in uh, unary. I don't know if what I'm saying makes uh, sense for um, uh, everybody. I think maybe in the room, kind of half the people are bored, half the people are not sure what I'm uh, saying. So written in unary just means that we're going to write a number in some very uh, expensive way just so that we don't get some strange relation between the size of the input and the numerical value of the numbers involved. So writing a number in unity just means writing one symbol for uh, 
um, like if you want to write the number 25 in unary, you just write 25 symbols. Writing in unary just means uh, writing kind of as many ones as the number that you are representing. Uh, and so about the entire thing, it's kind of canonical for in NP because it's just saying, well, uh, execute any non-deterministic machine in any time that you're telling me on uh, uh, any input that you want. So kind of pretty much by definition, any problem in NP can be mapped to instances of uh, this problem. Uh, now the issue is that if you uh, are now thinking of uh, a reduction from problem A and some distribution D of inputs, and you want to map it to BH under the uniform distribution. Well, now um, a reduction like this is not working because maybe the distribution D is giving very high probability mass to small number of possible axes, but uh, under the uniform distribution, those axes will have actually very small probability. So we are not preserving the uh, distributions. So what I'm going to explain uh, next is how to get a reduction like this actually to, uh, to work. I also need to explain a bit more accurately what I mean by the uniform distribution for uh, the bonding halting problem. But uh, I'll perhaps uh, do that later. So here is Levin's idea. That, that's really the biggest uh, idea in, uh, in the paper. It's to say to reduce an input X to the bonding halting problem. Um, I'll do something like this. I'll, uh, I'll compute a compressed representation of X. Uh, some kind of injective compression. Uh, M prime will uh, first uh, decompress X from uh, CX. And then it will simulate MA on X. So just as before, the effect that we are achieving is to simulate MA on X so the reduction is correct. And then T will be chosen so that it's uh, enough time to do the decompression plus the simulation of MA. So the, the idea here, it's that we want to create a, an input for the bonding halting problem that is a, as close to being uniformly distributed as possible. But what we are starting from, it's an X that is coming from a definitely, well, from a distribution that we know, but it's from very complicated, it's certainly far from, possibly far from uniform. But, if we optimally compress X, what does an optimal compression of X look like for a random X? Well, it's going to look essentially like a random string of bits. That's sort of, uh, sort of one of the intuitions from uh, uh, Shannon's theory that a, kind of when you compress a non-uniform distribution, what you obtain is kind of uh, uniform because if there was still uh, some bias in the bits that you obtain from the compression, uh, there would still be some kind of missing entropy and you could still uh, compress some more. Uh, and so now if you look at the output of this reduction, well, M prime is just uh, a fixed machine, just some code that is there and it's always the same. Uh, 
uh, it's not a random string of bits, but we're really kind of comparing a constant size string of bits to a random string of bits. So the kind of ratio between this probability, which is really what we are talking about, it's only a constant, so that's fine. So then we have C of X for random X. And uh, if it's uh, optimally compressed, that's also kind of like a random string. And then we have all kind of a string of symbols, but there is also a string of symbols in the distribution that we have in mind. And so, I mean, I'm literally waving my hands, but uh, uh, we will see calculations for um, all of this. Wait, well, T, T is actually all ones, or T is, a, you cho choose T to be a string of random symbols, but you only care about its length when you do random halting. Uh, uh, both work. If we want the reduction to be deterministic, uh, we should think of T as being a sequence of uh, all ones. Okay. Uh, otherwise, it, it doesn't work. If we allow probabilistic reductions, then we could think of T as being just some arbitrary sequence of symbols. And the number t is represented as the length of uh, that sequence. But but then but then that part of the if I if I do a deterministic reduction, then that part of the string m prime c of x t doesn't really look at all like a random string. And t might like because you have to write t in unary, this actually might be a, a very long part of the string. Yes, but uh, so that, that that's where the uh, notion of what it means for something to be a random instance of uh, the bounding halting uh, come from. So it, if we allow t to, because we're still saying t is in unary, so exactly what does it mean to have a random instance of this problem where a big chunk of it is supposed to be uh, all ones? So certainly one, one thing we could do is to say t is an arbitrary sequence of symbols. It's represented by its length. And um, uh, what we will do is to, but actually what Levin does uh, as well, it's sort of to cheat a bit on so the notion of what it means for something to be a random instance of uh, uh, bonded halting. So we'll define the, what it means for something to be a random instance of uh, bonded halting in the following way. Uh, so this is sort of uh, it's going to be a uniform uh, bonded halting instance of length n. Uh, so first, uh, we choose a random number from one to n. Uh, then we put uh, all ones to the right of that. And then we put uh, random bits to the left. So this way we will not have to deal with uh, uh, randomized reductions, but otherwise we could do what um, uh, some suggested. Okay, uh, and also for things to really work out, what we sort of have to the left of these all ones, which is sort of a Turing machine and uh, some input. So here I'm kind of putting these commas, but if you have strings of zeros and ones, you uh, cannot have commas. So what a properly formatted instance of bonding halting would look like is that there is a prefix free representation of the machine M. Then there is a prefix free representation of the string X, and then there are uh, all ones. And if uh, sort of things fail to be in the correct prefix free representation, we will just think of uh, um, M as being some fixed machine that always rejects. And so the default thing, it's a, it's a no input. This is just to have a series of conventions to say exactly how uh, things are, but other possible conventions would work. So the key idea is the data compression part. Okay. 
All right, so uh, how are we going to, uh, ex so this is sort of the um, idea, take an X and uh, map it into a invertible, optimally compressed representation of X, and then have the machine part of the instance of bonding halting be a machine that will uh, decompress X and then uh, simulate whatever is the non-deterministic algorithm for uh, problem A. So that takes us to uh, exactly what, what kind of compression we are going to use and uh, how will the definitions be satisfied. Um, so we will use what is called the uh, arithmetic compression or arithmetic coding. Uh, which will work because we um, have made this assumption about uh, the distribution on uh, our initial problem to have a polynomial time computable cumulative distribution. So um, arithmetic coding works in the in the following way. So we have this distribution uh, dn. Uh, now let's, uh, so this is a distribution over, let's say binary strings of length n or, or whatever objects of size n we are talking about. Let's uh, just think about uh, binary strings. Uh, so let's, as a mental experiment, uh, let's enumerate the support of uh, uh, dn. So let's think of it maybe just as being uh, all binary strings in uh, lexicographic order. Uh, and then here we write the cumulative probability. Uh, let's call it, um, I don't know. Uh, C of X, so some string X, and uh, here I have its uh, cumulative probability X. So maybe this has a very small one, and then the next one has a slightly higher one. So the idea of uh, arithmetic coding would be to uh, encode uh, each string X in the support of DN by its uh, cumulative probability. That's certainly, a, so that's as a kind of first uh, uh, approximation. Uh, that's because so let's, uh, that's because it's an injective mapping. If I tell you the cumulative probability of a string, I am, um, well, let's, so talking about the support of X, so kind of all strings have some uh, non-zero probability. So if I tell you the cumulative probability of a string, it uniquely identifies it because every other one yeah. All the preceding ones in lexicographic order will have a smaller cumulative probability. All the subsequent ones in lexicographic order will have a bigger one. Also, it's an efficiently invertible encoding because I can do binary search to find the string that has a certain cumulative probability. Right? If I see a string that has a bigger probability than the one that I'm looking for, I know that the one that I'm looking for comes before in lexicographic order. And uh, if the one that I'm, look, that I'm looking at has a smaller cumulative probability, the one that I'm looking for comes after in lexicographic order. So I can do binary research, kind of starting from um, 
0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, the string in the middle, and then progressively reduce my range of search by a half, it takes n steps to find the right string. Okay. Now, the thing is, those cumulative probability distributions might be uh, actually you know, huge numbers to write down, meaning with lots of uh, decimal digits. And there would be no, uh, no compression. So the uh, idea of uh, arithmetic coding is to encode X uh, using enough digits of uh, C of X to uh, distinguish it. from the predecessor of uh, X in the lexicographic order. Okay. And now actually let's think of uh, these properties as being written down in uh, uh, binary. So maybe X uh, looks uh, something like this. But the string before X, uh, I don't know, the predecessor of X, maybe it uh, looks like this. So the encoding of X according to arithmetic coding would be this binary string. Because it's uh, so enough digits to distinguish X from uh, the string that comes uh, before X in the lexicographic order. If the If the successor of X looks uh, uh, something like this, then this will be the encoding of the successor of X. So with this truncated encoding, we can still do binary search. Sort of thinking about there being all zeros after the truncated encoding. Because we still have increasing numbers and uh, uh, yeah, we can still do uh, binary search. So what is the point now of uh, this encoding? It's that the number of bits that it takes to encode X so it depends on how much precision I need to distinguish the cumulative probability of X from the cumulative probability of the predecessor of X. So it's a number of digits that depends really on what is the difference between the cumulative probability of X and the cumulative probability of the predecessor of X. But this difference is just the probability of X itself. So the number of digits uh, that are used to encode X are uh, at most actually they are essentially the same as something like uh, the soup of the logarithm to base two of one over the probability of X. Maybe plus one, but I, I don't think you need plus one, but uh, just uh, to be on the safe side. And uh, so you get it, right? You, um, 
I'm encoding a string by its cumulative probability distribution using enough digits to distinguish it from its predecessor, which means I keep going until I see a digit where my X and its predecessor differ. And uh, um, if I keep going for lots of digits, it means that the difference between those probabilities is very small. And, uh, um, and so the probability of uh, X is at most two to the minus the number of digits that I'm uh, using. Uh, so the number of digits is at most minus log of the probability of X. The audience is nodding, yeah. Huh? The audience is nodding, great. I don't need to keep going, great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, uh, this is actually optimal in the sense that, um, now if you take a random X, what will be the typical length of the encoding? Well, what will be the expected length of the encoding? Well, it will be the expectation uh, according to probability of X, of uh, log of one over the probability of X. That's the entropy of the distribution. So kind of up to plus one or plus two, uh, whatever is right. I am achieving an expected length in my encoding, which is the entropy of the distribution. I literally cannot do any better. So that's a particularly good uh, encoding strategy. Uh, but now let's see how, uh, so now let, let, so let's see what uh, the implication for this. Wait, there's a question. Uh, uh, yeah. Maybe this is a minor technical uh, issue, but if the support of the N is not the entire set of strings and you cannot really distinguish X from the predecessor. So you have to go around it somehow and it's not a big deal or? No, it is. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, this argument also assumes that you have an effective enumeration of the support of uh, the end. Okay. And that's... Um, um, I think that's okay for a lot of distributions, but uh, it can be a tricky condition to sort of add into the mix. That's right. All right, now let's uh, um, see what we've got. We well, I, sorry, if I continue. I think the way Levin dealt with that is that you always assume that inputs come as string of bits. So that there is some encoding of the objects that we're talking about into string of bits. And uh, instead of, I think instead of restricting to just the support like the elements with positive probability, he allows, so thinks about encoding arbitrary strings, including probability zero strings. So then his encoding will be something like uh, code zero followed by what I just described if the string has positive probability or one followed by the string itself if it has probability zero or even like less than one in two to the n. So I think this gets around the uh, uh, this issue because for count zero probability or low probability strings, you just have the string itself as part of the encoding. Uh, for the others, they have positive probability, so the binary search is well defined. But, uh, but yeah, you have to uh, take care of, um, of this issue one way or another. Right, so now let's say that uh, with all these pieces, we have our um, domination condition. So our reduction starts from X and uh, produces uh, machine M prime C of X. Now C of X is this arithmetic coding of X. 
and a sufficiently large running time. Uh, and actually, to make sure that we always construct uh, outputs of uh, uh, the same length, you know, this will be some uh, polynomial, fixed polynomial in the uh, length of x. Uh, will sort of be an upper bound so that we are sure we can fit and prime the encoding of x and the running time. If there is extra space, we'll just uh, make t bigger to uh, fill up the space because that doesn't, uh, if you overestimate t, you don't change the correctness of the reduction. All right, so uh, what does the uh, analysis of the reduction involve? So we have to say that for every possible output of the reduction, so for every kind of object that uh, looks like this, the probability, so now this, this mapping is actually injective by the way we constructed it. So there is only one X that can generate this Y. Uh, so we can just say the probability according to X. Well, okay, so this way the, the um, probability of uh, X needs to be smaller than uh, some fixed polynomial times, uh, maybe we'll call U for uniform, this distribution of bounded halting instances that you have constructed uh, of length n of y. So this is uh, what we need to make sure that is true. Okay, so, the, uh, so let's figure out what is the probability according to this uniform distribution of uh, y. Well, first of all, uh, the breaking point between T and the rest had to be there, but the breaking point was chosen uniformly. So that's uh, one over N. Uh, so then the bits of N prime, uh, you know, are what they are always when it generated according to X, but in the distribution, in the uniform distribution, they are random bits. So the probability that they're really like this, it's uh, one over two to the length of uh, M prime. And then there is the probability that the bits of uh, C of X are like this. And this is one over two to the length of C of X. But the length of C of X, it's uh, uh, it's this. It's the logarithm of the probability of x. So one over uh, uh, two to that. It's just It's just the probability of X. Uh, and then there is some, um, you know, there was this plus one. Uh, and here it's one over two of that. So that there is maybe an extra constant. And definitely it's, a, a, well, it's a theta one. So it's bigger than one over poly n times uh, d of x, uh, which is what we want. And actually I cheated a little bit here in that this c of x needs to be written in a prefix free, prefix free way. The way I described encoding is not prefix free. Uh, this can be fixed by adding an extra log n bits uh, 
to sort of uh, specify the length of uh, C of X. When we take one over two to the length of uh, C of X, we will pay an extra polynomial cost, but that's already accounted for here. But that's the, so apart from uh, all the technicalities, that's sort of the big idea to compress the data. Once you compress your data optimally, you get a random string and uh, now you're good. Okay, now uh, in the uh, remaining two minutes, I want to uh, just uh, point out some uh, issues with um, uh, uh, this reduction, then we sort of see that they are actually tomorrow when we talk about this some more. Actual issues that we haven't overcome in the past uh, 37 years. So, one issue it's uh, this one over two uh, to the length of uh, n prime. So, we have so we are comparing the string we are constructing constructing to a truly random string. Since we are fixing the description of uh, the algorithm that solves our initial problem as part of the string. Um, so each bit that we are fixing, it's half in, so it's a factor of two in the ratio between probabilities that we are creating and the target distribution. So overall, we lose something that is exponential in uh, the length of n prime. We're saying that that's a constant, it doesn't grow with the input. But this is something that is exponential in the length of the code, essentially, that describes how problem A is solved. And uh, really, this ratio in probabilities, they translate in running time. Because when we kind of talked about how we define efficiency, so well, we're assuming that to deal with the uh, you know, uh, problematic inputs of uh, smaller and smaller mass, maybe you'll take more and more time with some uh, polynomial trade-off. But so that means that if you are uh, kind of changing probabilities by two to the K, potentially that translates into two to the K more time in your algorithm. So here you're doing something that is exponential in the number of lines of code of so your way of solving A. And uh, you know, so even two to the 30, it's uh, the limit of feasibility. Two to the 100 is completely infeasible. How many programs we can write in 40 bits, not 40 lines of code, but like 40 bits, it's uh, almost nothing. So if so this exponential dependence on uh, the code, of some program that you have in mind is actually a big issue. This is an issue that arises in a lot of uh, universality results about average case complexity, including the existence of uh, universal one-way functions that maybe we'll uh, mention next time. And that appears to be unavoidable at this level of generality. Like if you want to really map problems into the other and you don't know anything about your initial problem, problem except the description of uh, how you would solve it if you had non-deterministic machines. Uh, so basically a description of how you verify the validity of solutions. These reductions lose something is exponential in the number of bits of the code that describes how you verify solutions. So that's mostly uh, infeasible. Uh, another related point is that in these reductions, you really have to sort of, you are fixing in uh, the instance that you construct something that describes how you solve your problem, your you know, initial problem. Now, if uh, the problem you're reducing to, like bonding halting, allows you to kind of describe programs, like Turing machines, as part of your instance, at least this part will be constant, even though this is already problematic. But for many other problems like trisat, click, and so on, we really don't know how to encode programs 
as kind of constant size pieces of your input. We know how to encode circuits as polynomial size pieces of your input. But those will be polynomial in the size of the circuit, so in the running time of the computation that you want to simulate. But we don't really know how to encode a program into a constant size piece of your instance. And uh, this is the biggest limitation of this theory. Right? The only problems that have been proved complete in this way are problems where there is some way to take a constant size piece of your input and uh, let it encode a generic computation. So another problem is complete. It's a problem that is like a puzzle, a tiling, where you have some fixed set of tiles and you're asking whether you can tile a square of a certain size by using tiles from this set and the adjacent tiles must have borders of the same color. So here, your description of the set of tiles easily describes uh, transitions of Turing machines and it's a constant size uh, piece of your input. But again, if you try to make this reduction work with uh, Trisat or max click, tensor decomposition, uh, you know, any uh, problem that has less structure, it doesn't seem possible to make these reductions work. Um, okay, on this uh, pretty uh, down uh, notes, I guess we'll uh, um, continue tomorrow. And I want to show you a way to map uh, the distributions that we don't know how to optimally compress to uh, still map them to the uniform distribution. In that case, instead of using compression, we will use hashing. So that's where I suppose it's like going from uh, unsupervised learning where you are kind of learning features that compress the data to using random features as an analogy. Um, and then we will uh, discuss some more the kind of things that this theory is not able to um, handle. And uh, uh, maybe also talk a bit about uh, how average case complexity is talked about in the setting of cryptography and uh, how you do reductions there. All right, so um, I, I can still answer questions if uh, you're not too hungry uh, to go to lunch. Uh, otherwise, we'll continue to run. Okay, so it looks like we have at least one question. Uh, I wanted to ask for clarification on this um, thing where you would need to assume you can compute CDFs of the distribution. So it seems like this, just to get to a sense of what, what distributions this rules out, like things like, uh, it feels like things like stochastic block model or planted clique or something where computing the probability of an instance requires summing over some very large set of potential hidden variables, like for these all these latent variable problems. This is, this is probably ruled out if you believe that those problems are sometimes computationally hard. Like, is that, is that a, the right intuition? Whereas say if, if the input was like a random graph, like a GNP graph, now you probably can compute these things. Yeah, I mean, for me, the most intuitive example, but I guess it's a bit out of scope, would be the output of a zero random generator. Uh, it's something that you just cannot compress. Uh, literally, in particular, you cannot compute these CDFs because it would um, um, well, allow you to compress it, and so also the zero random generators are uh, incompressible. But it's also true for a related reason, I guess, that the type of problems you're describing with planted solutions, it's difficult to compute a CDF because to get a handle of uh, kind of what kind of instances come before in lexicographic order, you will need to know which kind of uh, uh, Vertices were part of the clique, just like for this random generator, you will need to know what is the seed. I think these are uh, um, uh, highly problematic distributions. Yeah, when there is some kind of hidden information that can, um, I mean, I don't know how to kind of get the reduction from computing the CDF to, uh, so fighting the 
hidden solution in general, but uh, intuitively that's the kind of uh, difficulty. Thanks. More questions? All right, if there are no more questions, let's thank Luca one more time and look forward to tomorrow's lectures.